All right. Um, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for, for joining. I'm excited about today's discussion topic. Hopefully the networking was good um, and you were able to meet some, some good people. Everybody that I know on the call are awesome. So I know that at least you met some awesome people. Uh, for the new people, welcome. Um, we do this every week and you're welcome to join every week at 11 on Tuesday. Um, for the, the new faces, I'm Taylor Bench. I'm a managing director at Summit Venture Studio. We, we build software based on university technology. Uh, so professors that are doing research and creating software, we license that and then create market ready products. But this, this group was meant to uh, basically just help people get to know each other and also get educated on strategies, tools, templates that are executable in your business immediately. So the intent of this meeting is to have our weekly expert share some of their knowledge that you can all implement in your business as soon as you hang up. Um, so the structure, we'll do the networking and then now we'll have um, Tim present and for about 10 or 12 minutes. And then we'll jump into a Q&A discussion where everyone can just pepper Tim with any question you want to ask. Um, so before we jump into that, just a couple of announcements. Um, we are going to launch our first test of a new, um, a new Midday Connect activity, I guess I'll call it. It's the, what I'm calling execution sprints. And basically when we have a speaker that resonates well with the group, I'm gonna see if they're interested in doing an execution sprint, which is basically, I'm asking them to provide some of their services to the group at a highly discounted cost to execute what they presented on. So the first one example is long ship systems. Um, they presented a, a while back on the three critical campaign, three critical marketing automation campaigns that every company needs. And they've agreed to uh, take five or 10 companies through a four week sprint to launch all three of those campaigns. So look in your email for some more detail about that. But basically you get um, access to long ship for a four week sprint to launch some marketing automation campaigns. Um, so we'll jump into the presentation uh, right now. Tim Cooley, I'll let you give a little bit of your background, but Tim and I have known each other for a long time, have worked on several projects together. And um, he is now also the author of a new book that uh, hopefully you'll talk to us a little bit about Tim, but I will let you share your screen. And if you want to uh, put up your presentation, feel free if you've got one. Otherwise, the floor is yours. All oh, right. Also, sorry, one other thing. Please, everybody, if you've got questions or anything, throw them in the chat during the presentation, and we can, we can jump into those uh, after Tim is completed his presentation. So thanks. Now it's yours, Tim. Can you see my screen? Yes. Sweet. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for having me here today. Um, yes, I did launch a new book. It's all about pitch decks. Um, and I really want to show you guys a couple things that you can do to make these better. Um, and so a little bit about my background. Let's see if I can make this work. So as Taylor mentioned, we actually got to know each other in like what, 2013 um, through a program called Get Seated. Um, I was the third president of that program and it was crazy in an infancy at that time. It's still going strong at the University of Utah. And honestly, I think it's one of the best entrepreneurship programs in the world for raising capital as a student. And, you know, Taylor was instrumental in making that happen. Um, what's unique about that and why I got into what I'm doing is um, I sucked at raising capital and Taylor can tell you that. I was pitching and he kept turning me down. Um, and then we kept writing rules on why I couldn't get funded. And so we kept changing the rules and I'm like, well, look, I should have a leg up in raising capital yet I'm not. And yet the guys who kept pitching kept raising capital. And it was so frustrating to me as an entrepreneur and I'm the one writing the rules. So 
I kept watching why these other people kept getting funded and, you know, just kept thinking like, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? Um, fast forward a couple of years, um, I became the executive director or the general manager of the mill, which is an accelerator in um, Sandy, worked with 300 ish companies um, on all aspects of business, um, including fundraising. And then I got involved in Park City Angels. Um, and so Park City Angels, uh, there's a couple of you guys on this call, which is great, um, is the largest and most active angel group in Utah. Um, and so I got to, again, be part of this process of learning why companies were getting funded and why they weren't. And as you can see at the bottom here, I've worked on a lot of stuff. This is just a handful of things that either worked or didn't work for whatever reason. Um, but I've been involved in this for a while. And so I think my background is super important to understanding that I've tried and failed. And I've also tried and succeeded in some places. So um, what a lot of people don't realize, there's very few people who get funded through venture capital. It's about 1% of people that um, actually get funding. And that's a terrible statistic. And a lot of it has to do with the pitch itself. Um, and so here's some of the big things I want you guys to take away. Um, you know, they don't understand what the pitch is for, like the goal, how to make it flow. I'm going to talk about a couple of things to not do. Um, I'm going to show you how there's a lack of clear problem and solution. And then I'm going to show you how most people don't see the numbers, but investors do. So hold on. I want to go quick through this so we can get to Q&A, but um, it's super important. So um, the solution here is to learn how to pitch better, right? So um, if you don't understand the goal of the pitch, if it's not clear in the solution, the, the problem isn't clear and the solution isn't clear, no one's gonna fund you. And if you don't know your numbers, you're not gonna get funded. And so here's an example, right? Um, the goal of a pitch is not to get funded. And that might blow people's mind. The goal of the pitch is get to the next meeting um, and which is called due diligence, right? So anytime you're pitching and that could be an elevator pitch, a one-liner or whatever, your whole objective is to get to the next meeting with any investor. So keep that in mind. If you do get the chance to get a formal presentation, like again, you're not getting funded that day. No one's writing you a check um, that very moment. It's never happened. I've been doing this for 10 years. I've never seen that happen. And so just remember your goal is to get to the next meeting. Um, when you walked in, you already had a yes. So everything you do from that moment on is a no. And so keep the people in the yes. They wanna get excited and invite you to the due diligence meeting. So keep that in mind. Um, here is how you maintain the flow of your story. So first it's a conversational tone. And then you want to think about your presentation as a question and answer component. That'll help you maintain this very casual, informal environment. Um, I put the order here that you should do. There's a lot of controversy around this, but as I studied, I don't know, thousands of pitches, the ones that do it in this order actually have a higher likelihood of success. And the reason being is when you're an investor, you're asking questions. So for example, it's like, why are you here? And your response is, I'm trying to solve this major problem in the world. Oh, cool. How are you doing that? Well, let me show you how I'm doing that. That's your solution slide. Well, great. How do you make money? Okay, well, let me show you how I make money. So you can see how that has this natural question answer response. And the order that I have here is actually a very solid order when investors are listening to what you're saying to have a higher outcome. Um, yeah. Okay, a couple things don't do. Do not use video. Everyone thinks that video is gonna solve all your problems. 90% of the time, maybe 95% of the time, it makes it worse. Um, you have a lack of it and being embedded properly. You need access to the internet. You're not a good video creator. So usually video sucks. Um, video is actually just a bunch of pictures, so use pictures. Um, animations, people like those little twirly things, don't do that stuff. Like you have very limited time, just show us. You're not doing a magic trick, um, just show us what's going on, take us to the next slide, um, don't do animations. Um, do not use note cards. If you're reading, oh great, I got a typo. But if you're reading your um, note cards, it makes you look very unprepared. You should know your business. And again, if you keep it in that conversational um, mindset, you won't need note cards. And then also don't memorize. Um, this happens a lot on Shark Tank. If you ever watched that show, 
like when someone forgets a line or they start going down this rabbit hole and they forget, they look really unprofessional and that will take you right to a no. Um, okay, I wanted to speed through those things, but I wanna focus, here's one of the biggest problems people have when they pitch. Um, we hear this concept of problem solution fit and everyone's like, oh yeah, I got that. But here's how it plays out, right? your solution needs to be the exact opposite of the problem, right? So you should be able to say, here's the problem in the world and this is how we solve that problem. If it's not clear um, and a six-year-old can't say your problem and solution, then you need to re keep reworking it until it gets to that point. So let's take an example, right? Um, people can't smell smoke while they're sleeping, right? Pretty clear problem. So we built a smoke detector. That makes sense. Um, and that's how clear everyone's problem should be. When, when we're looking at screening deals, if I can remember how clear that is, I can also tell you the market size without ever seeing your slides. I'm already interested in like, oh shoot, that does seem like a real problem. But here's what a lot of people do. They say, we help people maximize their productivity. Well, first of all, you've confused problem and solution. You've already started to tell me about your, pro or your solution and yet you didn't really address the problem, right? So is productivity really the problem? So, so you can see that as the question. And then how do you show that, right? If you're saying that productivity is the problem, you introduced your product, then your sh solution should say, we increased productivity by 30%. That's how clean that statement segment should go. Um, and a lot of people don't, they mess that up. Um, and then the final one, and this has really been big in the last, I'd say five years is every, company has some kind of social mission. Um, and so, for example, they'll start off with their problem being, you know, there are people starving on the streets or some variation of that. Um, and then you come to find out that they sell backpacks. Well, the true problem a backpack has or solves is the ability to carry something, right? So if you're like, hey, we're going to start a business that, you know, we want you to be able to carry things and whatever, then your solution is a backpack right? You just, the marketing angle is helping people get food on the streets. And that's great to add later in the deck, but it's not the problem solution fit um, that an investor is listening for. Okay. So if you make it past the problem solution, right? So that's the first two slides of most decks of the first three slides. So if you make it past that, here's another really, really problem area for most people. Everybody wants to inflate their numbers. And here's three slide examples of how you can demonstrate your numbers. So we're only on the first five slides of the deck so far. Um, your business model should be super, super simple. We sell this product for this much money and here's a little bit of details about that. Okay, so keep that slide simple. Your second slide should be built off the slide before. So remember casual conversation. Okay, cool. So how many do you plan to sell in the next five years? Well, let me show you. Um, don't do anything more than this slide. A lot of people want to do like a Excel spreadsheet. Don't do that. It can actually make things worse. So just show a graph that goes up into the right and some basic numbers. The third slide is the market slide. So I was in a call the other day and the SOM, SOM is the people you are actively targeting right now. You're going to pick up the phone and call these people was like 1.9 billion. Uh, nobody's SOM is that big. Um, but so you got to be very, very focused on who you're going after and make sure it relates to the problem, to the, the thing that you talked about at the very beginning. And what's interesting about this is these three slides are so connected. Most investors don't realize that they're doing this in their head, but they're actually doing a gut check to make sure your numbers make sense. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time on finance slides, but they're like, hmm, I don't believe you. So A, they don't believe you on your projections anyways, but because you put numbers in weird places, now they do this little internal gut check. So for example, um, let's say your SOM is 1 billion and you said that you're gonna hit 200 million in year five. So basically, you know, 20% of the market um, and your ask is 250K. That's not possible. I don't care what you're doing. That logic of numbers doesn't make any sense. So what you've said to the person is, we have no idea what we're doing. Um, and that, that comes out really quick in just these three slides. Well, your ask as well. Um, but so another version would be like, hey, look, we're, our SOM is 200 million. 
you know, in the first five years, we plan to hit 5 million in sales. And then we're asking for 250 K right now. So 5 million is about 2%, about 3% of 200 million. And as an investor, as someone who's listening, you're like, oh, that seems reasonable. So this is kind of how these slides all connect. Um, it's a little inside secret that they, most people don't even know they're doing it, um, but now you do. Okay, so we're close to the 12 minute mark, but um, I wanna help you guys increase the, increase the likelihood of being funded. And so to pitch better, you have to keep the mindset that your goal is just to get to the next meeting, keep the conversation in this like question answer. So being like, I'm glad you asked. Um, don't do videos, no transitions, no note cards, do not memorize. Um, clearly state the problem and the solution and then know your numbers. I hope that's helpful. And I'll open up to questions. Awesome, thanks, Tim. Yeah. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. So if you've got questions, um, please just unmute yourself um, or it might be <clears throat> easier if you throw it in the chat and then I'll go through or just say, hey, I've got a question um, and I'll go through so we're not all talking over everybody. So just throw your name up in the chat and then we can do this more orderly. So first question was Greg's, um, can we get a copy of this deck? Tim, are you, are you comfortable sharing the, the deck that you presented? Yeah, totally. Um, there's way more to this, so buy the book. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yasmin's doing a pitch in a month. Yasmin, awesome. what, are, what are you most nervous about for your pitch? What, what can you ask Tim to help you uh, in your pitch? My financials. And that's kind of what is going on at school right now, too. The workbook is, it's not my wheelhouse. So it's giving me some sleepless nights. Um, so I think getting my financials and our projections right is essential to the ask, like you said. Um, yeah, that's so what I'll just say this, don't stress on it. Um, double sales every year and call it good. It, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, most businesses, even huge corporations can only predict sales up to 90 days. So to think that we can do it for five years on something that's not proven, um, it just, just make sure, just make sure the final number in year five makes sense with who you're targeting today in that marketing and you'll be fine. Cause no one, no one believes you anyway. So yeah, it's unless it's a school project, then, you know, whatever, but yeah, yeah don't worry about it. Okay. Thank you. What, and then and what are the most critical Michael. assumptions they should they should address in those financials? Like yeah, so the unit economics or or what do you want to see in those? Yeah, so Yasmin, yours is a physical product company. So what slide one is, hey, we have, you know, I don't know what you do exactly, but let's say it's lip balm. We sell it for 20 bucks, it costs us two. You know, in year one, we plan to sell a thousand. In year two, we hope to get to five thousand, you know, and it, it's very simple to map it out that way. And then, yeah, do five years. Five years is always pretty good. You can do three. Um, and again, no one believes you anyway. So um, you just kind of have to have that slide. I'll, I'll hit a quick question, Tim. Can okay. you define SOM? Yeah, SOM is your um, service obtainable market. So the way that I would um, describe this is if you're going to pick up a phone and call one person, who is that person? And then build your market around that one person. So for example, TAM or yeah, TAM is the total addressable market. That's anybody in the whole wide world that could use your product. Um, and then you keep breaking that down into smaller subgroups. Cool. Tyler asked, what are the common things you hear in first pitches that should have been left for later meetings? Um, a, a lot of people want to go into the technical details of their um, solution. You don't really need to do that. Uh, this happens a lot in the sciences. Um, I really don't care what a polymer something, DNA, riboflavin, I don't know what that is, but I don't care what it does. Um, I just want to know if there's a big enough market and if your solution actually works. Um, this actually happens a lot when people do, people do feature creeps. Um, you know, it, you should be directly problem and then solution. So if you list three problems, you should only be talking about the three solutions to those problems. Um, you can leave those later. 
also what happens is people will talk about, um, so let's say for example, your target market is a certain person, but someone else bought it. Um, that wasn't really your, your target market, but they'll start throwing that in early. Leave that till later as well. Like, hey, we're gonna go into you know, wineries later or whatever, but leave that out of the, out of the initial conversation. Cool. Spencer Loveless, do you want to unmute yourself and give some context for your question on typical asks for funding in the next round? Yeah, I was just wondering, is it, is it usually hundreds of thousands? Is it usually millions? Like what, once you get to that next stage, obviously you said don't, um, don't ask for money on the first stage, but what, what do people typically get? Yeah, so um, you're going to ask for money on that this round, but you're not going to be getting the money today. So that's the what I meant by that. Um, the amount raised is whatever you need to hit the milestone. So T Taylor and I built, you know, really built this get seated. And if it was 500 bucks to get to the next milestone, that's what you asked for. Why would you need 10,000 if you only need 500? And so keeping that in mind, um, you, you ask for what you need. Um, I will say this, though it's as difficult to raise a quarter of a million dollars as it is to raise a million. So just be, it's, it's a, a road show. So just be careful with that and make sure it's what you need. Um, I, I don't have a good answer. Okay. Tim, when you're, sorry to interrupt, when, when you're saying uh, the, the money, the, I guess the question was ask for funding. Are you, so you're kind of thinking we would probably be best to kind of like project what our cash burn would be, I guess to yes. get to that milestone. Yep, so let's say you needed three people to join the team, right? So 100 grand per person. Uh, you need to spend, let's say 200K in marketing. Um, so that right there, and let's say that gets you to version two and you're gonna sign up 50 clients, um, that you need half a million for the next 12 months. That's what you just said. Okay, perfect. Um, Paul S said, do you have any good examples of how, how to demo a product without a video? Yeah. So what you want to do is again, so going back to whatever the problem is you're solving. So take whatever that is and then show the solution with, a, you only really need one slide, right? Or maybe two, but you're like, so here's how our technology solves that problem. Here's the outcome that we saw. Um, again, I don't want to say you can't use video, but it just rarely ever works. Um, the other way you can do it is just give it to the people. If it's a technology and you want to show it, just, you know, throw it up on an iPad and show them what you're doing or whatever. Um, but the majority of people can do it with just pictures if they do it well. Um, Clayton says, Tim, how many pitches should we mentally prepare for in regard to rejections? All of them. <laughs> no. Um, if you're in front of the right person, um, then, you know, it can take one. You, all you need is one person to say yes. But the reality is, is, you know, prepare to try and do a hundred. Um, you know, sometimes you, what you'll have and you'll have burner, burner pitches, you know, so a great group is 1 million cups um, to go and practice just that first pitch, get it out of the way. Um, and then uh, go and try and, you know, meet somebody like me and try and get in front of one of the groups. Yeah, I, um, my experience there, Tim, just to add to that, I think you're right on the order of magnitude there. When I was in the investment banking world, we would we would tell our clients, we're going to try and get you in front of 150 people, because that's what we typically saw. You'd pitch 150 times, get three to five term sheets, and then one of them would be the investor. So that was kind of our model, it was a while ago, so it may have changed a little bit, but that was pretty typical for us. It happened. Um, <laughs> any, oh, we got that one. Um, how much info should be provided on each section slash slide? How much detail should be included in bios versus attaching CVs? Yeah, so this is a good one. So um, just enough. Um, you wanna keep everything super high level so that you want people to ask questions, right? Um, I could have given you all the details all in this, but I want you to ask questions, right? And you want investors too as well, um, because that shows that they're interested. Um, and as far as bios are concerned, you wanna only say what their role is and how they apply to this venture. 
Um, let's say my background is marketing SaaS companies and I joined an e-commerce company. I do have marketing background, but I'm not really an e-commerce guy. Um, so uh, you kind of just want to say like, look, 20 years of marketing experience, right? Like, so you just kind of want to make sure it's around this venture um, when you're giving bios. Uh, Eric Lowe asked, is using PowerPoint still valid or is it better to use slide bean, et cetera? I think everything should be done in PowerPoint. Um, you should also make a PDF version. And if you're on Apple doing Keynote, um, but always convert to PowerPoint. The reason for that is if you don't know the format of the, um, the event, sometimes power or anything other than PowerPoint gets messed up. Um, so your colors might come off wrong or your, your font might not work right. PowerPoint seems to universally work on every machine. Um, and so I think so use PowerPoint. Cool. Steve Wood asked about numbers. Uh, assume most investors are more interested in you knowing the parameters of costs, break even market size, anything after is a function of assuming market penetration that's plausible. Um, Steve, any context there that you think um, we could have Tim address or? Yeah. I'll just add to that. I agree, um, but those are great questions. So I think leaving certain information like that out is really, really good because you know you're going to get asked them and it's a perfect softball question for you. Cool. Um, in terms of other media, Tim, do you recommend printing a deck out or when would you or not? So if you're going to print anything, um, I would print out a little one pager. On my website, which is timmelcooley.com, there's a free one pager creating tool. Um, but you don't really need it. Uh, it but you don't need to print anything out. 90% um, of the time, they just get left behind anyways. Um, but it is nice also to have. I, I, I don't, you can do it. It doesn't hurt you, but you don't need it. Greg Lloyd asked for seed funds, does revenue matter more than just showing good growth or is it common to do pre-revenue raises? Um, revenue always matters. Uh, it's very rare today to get pre-revenue um, companies funded. It still happens, but it's probably, I would say, especially in Utah, maybe less than 5% of companies. Um, and the reason for that is you're just competing against somebody who already has revenue. If everybody was pre-revenue, um, then more companies would get funded at pre-revenue. But, you know, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, the, the company has been de-risked a little bit, so it makes it easier to invest in a company that's already at revenue. If a company is pre-revenue, do you have any suggestions on how to be in that 5%? Yeah, so be really good at presenting. Um, and then the other thing is, is have a really strong pedigree for what you're doing. If you've spent 15, 20 years in your industry, you know all the players, it's a really compelling case that you're the one that's going to win. Um, you know, I, I think that those are the ones that I've seen get funded at pre-revenue have always had that like, look, we're just taking what we've done for 20 years, commercializing it, and we're ready to go. Cool. Um, how would you present multiple? So this is from Tyler Fox. How would you present multiple revenue models in the financial slides? For example, if you have a services subscription model and say revenue sharing model, one short term, one long term, would you present both? Stick with one. What are your thoughts there, Tim? Um, so in your case, it sounds like you have two revenue models. You can show both of those. Um, what you it, like in my book, it talks about having three revenue models. So you have like an A, a B, and a C, but you could combine an A and a B or a B and a C or an A and a B, or you could do A, B, and C. If you get that, that's complicated. Um, but so what you want to do is kind of like in your case, just do the two. So you're going to say, look, we have a service model that's 50 bucks a month, or we have this rev share that's, you know, 8% or whatever. And then you can show on your financials that chart split up in the two revenue pathways and, and do it as a combined. So it looks like you know, like, like this. I don't know if you can see my screen, but they, they get bigger or whatever. Um, that's the best way to do it that way. If you can incorporate a picture of Tim doing this in your presentation, I would. Yeah, you'll, you'll get funded for sure. Yeah. Um, is it, what are your thoughts on having a physical prototype at the first pitch, Tim? 
Totally. If anytime you can demonstrate your product, you should. So I like to use the phrase show, don't tell. Um, and yeah, if you can have a physical prototype, bring it in. And that's why like going back to the video, um, you know, demo it, if you can do it on the app itself. So I had a gaming company and we just let people play the game. Um, and so. Nice. Um, where are some places that you would suggest doing practice pitches or burner pitches? Yeah, so 1 million cups, there's three of them. I would do all three if you can. So down in Provo was one in Ogden and then there's one in Salt Lake. Um, I, there's other networking groups that do that. Um, I think those are the best ones. Um, and then I don't know what else is out there. I haven't been in that circuit for a while, so. So 1 million cups is national. I mean, if you're, so some of you I know on the call are not here in Utah, but there's typically a chapter of 1 million cups that will allow people to come and present. I think others may be um, university pitch events. Um, and I've seen- uh, Rev Road has a competition. I just saw Boom Startup has a competition that's launching in like, I don't know, three days or two days. Um, so those are all their good places to kind of practice. Yeah. Um, you know, Startup, uh, Silicon Slopes used to have a, a, a competition as well. Um, so any competition that's local, I would, jump on those. Um, oh, Michael, Michael Hall asked suggestions on how to get in front of 100 different investors. Um, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a couple ways to do this. Tap your network is the first one. And then when you're tapping those people, ask them to make introductions. Um, that's the, the best way to do it. The other way, and this is kind of controversial, is to hire someone to help you. Um, I mean, that's what I do for my day job is we, we do that. Um, but again, I, I think even with that, it's always best to tap your own network first. Um, and if you don't know people, ask. Um, like, so for example, you can ask me if there's somebody I know that's in that space. And never ask for funds. Always ask for advice. And then the, the funds will come and the introductions will come if it's going to work out. Um, if you do get another meeting, this is from Cynthia Wong. If you do get another meeting, how much do investors usually take in equity? So typically each round is 10 to 20%, depending on where you're at with the company. Um, if you're doing a, this early round where you don't know the valuation, you're going to use some kind of safe agreement, or you're going to use some kind of convertible note. I'll have to look those up, but basically it still falls in line with this like 10 to 20% range. One of the ways that I've used to uh, better understand what that looks like is being able to walk through your numbers that Tim was talking about, all your financial numbers and figure out what valuation you think you will get at certain time periods and then back into what your current investors in that round are looking for in terms of return models. So That's angels, great. Tim, maybe you could go through a little bit of that in terms of what typical angels, seed investors and VCs look for in terms of return models so that then you can back in and say, okay, if, if I'm gonna be a $10 million company in four years, how much will I have to sell to the investor to get them the valuation they want and the return that they want? Right, so I'll, I'll go backwards. So VC groups want a 10X return. So if you're at that stage, Typically you're raising between like three and 15 million, let's say um, five to 15, but they want 10 X return. So they, that means they they need to make more than 150 million off of you. Right. So 10 times angels are all looking for the hundred X return. Um, so they're going to give you $20,000 or a hundred thousand or 250 K and they really want your company to go and do something big. Um, they're making a lot more bets with smaller dollar amounts. So kind of work that into your model. Um, I, would, I would say the average is probably about 15% equity, um, but just kind of keep that in mind. They're, they're trying to make a lot more than 10% or 10X on the return. Um, uh, this is a question from Yasmin. Uh, do you recommend delaying a pitch if you want to show more growth so you still have enough funding for a year. At what point is the sweet spot that you've seen, Tim, where 
a company isn't seen as desperate and the investors will just wait them out to get a smaller, a lower valuation versus, okay, you've got the right balance sheet. We want to invest now. Like, how do you manage that and balance that? Yeah. So what I would do is pitch now, if you have a year of funding left with the intent on following up in six months to eight to, or to, you know, nine months. Um, again, most relationship or most funding is relationship driven. Um, we've had so many companies get funded the second time they presented versus the first because they did that. They went out and, you know, grew the company, they made a big contract and then they came back and say, Hey, look, we're a better company now anyways. So, um, and we like to see that, but build the relationship early. Um, just keep in mind, if you're super early, you're competing against other people who aren't as early and you may not get selected, um, for the group, but it's always still better to start the conversation. So a couple of questions um, around getting introduced to investors or a comment also from Spencer. Um, how important is it to have a warm introduction to an investor? And then Tim, do you mind talking a little bit about how people can tap their network? What the best methodology of doing that is and asking for advice versus asking for funding? I mean, when people are pinging you either on LinkedIn or email, what is most compelling for you to either pick the phone up or, or actually invite them to a pitch? Yeah, so it's always, okay, let me look at the process for Park City Angels. Every month we get, we look at five companies to start with. Of those five companies, four are angel referrals. So if anybody in the group wants a company to present, they always get the opportunity to present. So a warm introduction is always better than a cold one. The fifth slot is up to me to decide. And I like the cold. Um, I felt like I was always in the cold. So I want to give people opportunities. Um, that doesn't mean all five or ever get selected from or the first four are from the angels. So typically maybe the five are can all be cold. But um, that's, that's how I do it. Uh, so it's always better to have a warm. But if you don't, like, make sure you just reach out to people. Um, so if you're going to raise money from Park City Angels, like I will meet with you. Um, second to that is how do you go through your network? Um, so that there's a couple of cool tools. One's called Sig Parser. It can just scrape your, your emails um, for email addresses. And you can just email people to see if like, hey, look, I'm raising capital. Would you mind taking a meeting with me? Um, you don't know who people know. So that's kind of the, one of the better ways of just seeing what's out there. Another way to do it is be a little bit more intentional on LinkedIn. So if you know a company, so let's say, for example, Myriad Genetics, you know the CFO or whoever makes really good money. Um, if you have a connection there, like go and meet with them, you know, go and meet like C-level people at uh, big organizations. Typically, um, typically they're investing and they don't know it, or they'll definitely connect you with other people who might be. Um, so that's another way of doing it is like, you know, surf the C-suite. Cool. Um, maybe last question right now, if, if we can, um, answer it quickly, we may jump into another one, but how do investors, this is from Greg Lloyd, how do investors look at companies that are with accelerators like RevRoad or Boom Startup? How does that affect an investor's view of a company? Um, so I guess that depends on the person themselves. So a lot of the companies who've gone through Rev Road have actually been funded through Park City Angels. Um, so what, what's nice about an accelerator is typically they've helped them grow. Um, and so now a company is showing numbers that other investors like. Um, so they can be good. Um, I don't think there's anything negative from an investment point of view as an investor. Um, but you got to make sure you manage your cap table properly. So like who has equity, how much they have, what are the terms there? Um, yeah, I think that's the right way to answer that. Cool. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Tim, thanks so much. This is awesome. I would suggest to everybody go, t go check out Tim's book on Amazon. Um, I've, I've gone through most of it so far. I'm not as fast a reader. It's only been out maybe a week or so, Tim, is that right? Yep, that's correct. And is the best place just to go on Amazon and search your name for your book? Yeah, so do the pitch deck book and then my name and it'll pop right up. Okay. Um, a lot of great um, insight in the book, much like what Tim presented today. So it's really helpful. 
Um, and Tim, thanks so much. Everybody, feel free to reach out to Tim on LinkedIn. I'll just invite everybody for you. Yeah, go for it. That's what I do. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks for joining everybody. And um, we'll see you next week. All right, thanks, everyone.